Okay, our next speaker is Dr. David Poston. Uh, Dr. Poston's been a speaker at our event uh, for several years now. Um, he's now started a new company called Space Nukes. I can't wait to hear all about what he's working on now. Excellent, man. I, that talk from Dan was so awesome. That's 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 exactly a good tie-in to to what I'm going to talk about because. Uh, about 75% of the power we're going to need on Mars is to deal with the water, to extract it, to uh, melt it, then to turn it into propellants and oxygen. Awesome. All right. So, yeah, no, I'm super excited to be here again. I love, I love the Mars Society Convention because um, I think pe it's people that want to try to uh, get something done instead of just being there for their parochial interests to, you know, try to to get into the next government program. So I, this is my favorite forum. So I thank you for, uh, for inviting me again. And, I, and I've tried to add some new things uh, to talk about. And there's, there's, at the end, there is something exciting starting to go on. So uh, that's the good news. Um, so uh, I'm gonna get a pointer going here. Uh, so, you know, we need, we obviously, everybody knows we need a lot of power, right? Uh, uh, to, to create the oxygen and, and get the water, power habitats and rovers and everything we'd want to do. And we have kind of evolved to a human infrastructure that kind of just uses electricity as what I call our energy middleman for almost everything, where we almost anything, we make it so you can plug it in and run it, e even if you're doing a hairdryer, which is kind of weird to go from, from some thermal heat to electricity back to thermal heat. But so, so electricity is what, what we're basing, going to base this, this whole operation on. Uh, we'll still use process heat when we can to, to get to the ice as well. But, you know, it, and then the, the other big part of it is, is Robert uh, Zubrin, you know, noticed many years ago, the only way to make these trips to Mars affordable and efficient is to make your propellant in situ. And that, that's really where a lot of the energy goes uh, to make your methane and uh, liquid oxygen. And so that's, uh, that, the, so the, the last talk was a perfect tie-in and, and, and goes along with what I'm gonna say. Actually, I had a different chart here before, but you know, why do we need nuclear? And, and a lot of it comes down to what you just saw. I mean, the good water is, is at 40 latitude or higher and really good might be at 60. Um, and, and you get to the point where the, the sunlight gets, gets very dim. Um, and so you get to it. I'll, let me go through the slides and talk about this chart. Uh, but the solar insulation starts at half of Earth, right? And then you get the dust storms, which, which are a serious problem. And we, we see them all the time. And they can last months, even years in length. Uh, and, you know, you, luckily you get diffuse life. It doesn't cut it down to zero, the light. But makes it a small fraction. So you have to account for that. You have colder and longer nights, you know, and storing, uh, storing um, electricity or um, is getting to be a better, or just energy, better technology, but it's really cold. Um, and uh, it, that's just another big challenge. And it is, it's really highly dependent on latitude and season. Um, and so uh, if you look over at the right, you know, this, this is, the Viking one was over at a pretty far north latitude. I can't remember what it was, but it might've been like 30, 35, 40. Um, and, and during the winter time, not only did it get bad, there were a couple of dust storms that really brought your, your optical depth or how much sunlight gets through down to really low, low values. And so it really becomes a challenge and it's not even great, even if the sun's out. And that, but once you throw in, in latitude and potential dust storms, then then nuclear becomes the clear winner. Uh, and then you also have we might want to be down in a crater, right, where where you have trouble with with a solar power. Um, so all of this comes to down to you know where where we're going to want to be, how robust the power we want, and then in the end you still have to deploy a huge array. Uh, and keep it clean. And, you know, in, in most of us realize the moon is as bad or worse, depending on what your problems are there. You've just got super long darkness, unless you're up on the north uh, or south poles where you can get do better. But it, it has even, even 
as much or more challenges. So I think, think everyone's come to realize we do need nuclear uh, for the Mars service. Uh, and then you get to why fission. It's pretty easy to see why fission when it comes to, um, uh, you know, what we use now, we call nuclear power in space is radioisotope power, which is great. And it's really enabled a lot of cool stuff, including rovers on Mars and especially the deep uh, outer planet missions. But you just can't get enough power out. Um, you're pretty limited to about a kilowatt. And beyond that, plutonium has become really scarce and expensive. Everything we did before was just based on the old weapons, kind of waste from the weapons program. And now we're really hurting to try to get any uh, plutonium-238. Uh, then, then you look at the rest of this and you, you notice these energy densities are huge, right? Uh, for fission, fusion, and antimatter. They're all way beyond what we could do with real engineering unless we had Scotty to tell us the magic uh, materials like he did in uh, Star Trek IV, was that it, Search for Spot? No, no, uh, Voyage Home. Uh, so so we, uh, we, can't, we can't really use everything fission can offer right now. And so trying to, I mean, so it, 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 fusion and antimatter in the long term will be great when you're trying to do interstellar voyages, but, but it, for now, Vision is the thing to focus on because we know the physics. Um, and, um, you know, what, and once we get that, you know, we'll probably on Mars just be able to switch to in situ power if we get a big enough society there to make solar uh, panel cells on Mars and use in situ energy storage, maybe geothermal, maybe even wind, which sounds absurd, but it, it maybe it could be done. Or maybe we find some uranium thorium materials, but but vision is what we need now. So I I think I think pretty much everybody agrees on that. I lo always love these charts because they 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 continue to amaze me every time I put them together. So this is me holding one piece of our crusty core. There were three pieces in the core in my hands. Um, and there's two things to notice. One is it's not dangerous, right? I, don't, I put on gloves to protect the fuel, not to protect my hands. <laughs> I, you know, we didn't want to get oils on, oils on the, uh, the fuel. You know, and I'm sitting there, you know, I don't have a mask on or anything. It, you know, it, it's, it's totally benign. So that's one thing just everyone needs to, uh, you know, chill about the, the safety issue with, with, uh, with fission. Um, and, and the other thing is, you know, how much energy there is. This one piece that I'm holding in my hand, if you could fission all the atoms, is equivalent of 121 Falcon Heavies worth of energy uh, if you fully burned all of the, uh, the RP-1. And so it really is as much energy as we want to use for, for probably centuries. I mean, it, you know, it, depending on, you know, how much we, we burn of it, but uh, it's, uh, the hard part's not creating the energy, it's utilizing the energy. All right, so, so this is the question, the first question I would ask if I wasn't in this field, you know, if they, these are so great, why don't we have any, right? And, and that's a really good question. And uh, there's a lot of things that come into play. The bottom of the line is we have a lot of failed programs, but the, right now there's just, there, with reactor technology and a lot of things, the perception is much stronger than reality. If you read your news feeds, you'll see that there's uh, you know, advances in reactors being built right and left. You know, these, all these micro reactors and special purpose reactors. And, and everyone thinks progress is being made in nuclear engineering. This is how it's been like in 40 years. Um, and, you, know, you know, and that, that there's this impression that, yeah, there's these programs going on, things getting done but nothing's getting done. And that's, that's the, the place we are, you know, except for in China, of course. Uh, but so the, the reality is there hasn't been a new reactor power system built and tested in the United States in over 40 years, uh, except for the thing we did in, in Krusty a few years ago. And, and, and what makes things even worse is, you know, it's getting harder to get a, a new reactor program sold and done because solar and battery technology continue to improve and have raised the bar significantly, which is awesome. Because if we, they had done a good job, then, then we'd be in worse shape than we are. But, 
All right, the reason we've done all these programs and there's really two reasons these programs, you know, I've worked on them, you know, pretty much all of them uh, and uh, why they fail. I mean, the bottom line, a program fails because it lost support, either because it was too expensive or dragged on with insufficient progress. And everyone always likes to blame their program dying on the fact that the customer lost interest, changed priorities. But that's because we didn't get far enough to, to sustain the program and sustain their in interest. The biggest thing problem we've got right now is oversold paper reactor concepts because there's always somebody that can claim they can provide a high performance system to get a customer interested and sell the program, even though they really don't know what they're talking about or you know, if this thing can actually be built and done. And the other, the other has been the traditional, what we call white collar welfare um, that, that NASA and DOE and all, all, all through you know, the government like to, to spend money. But, the, but in this case, you know, continue to go up, stay on the side of paper studies and maybe a, a niche technology instead of let's just develop a real reactor system. And that, that's really what led to our big lack of capability um, is it, it's hard to imagine as a nuclear engineer that in the 50s and 60s, there were over 100 new reactors built and tested. All of them uh, uh, in every reactor we use today is based on several ground tests uh, that were done. And what we call Idaho National Laboratory now used to be the greatest place on earth if you're a reactor person. It's, uh, they tested over 50 reactors in. But of course, there hasn't been a new reactor built in 40 years. So all of that, all of that expertise and wisdom is gone. Now, those guys knew what they were doing. Um, but, but now we're back to ground zero and why we have to do something simple. And that's what, that's what Space Nukes is trying to do to get a first generation system deployed so we can start to actually uh, make these reactors. So, so that's, that's uh, our technology uh, is the kilopower technology. And I've, you've seen some of that in previous presentations and, and the, uh, the, the next, I, I condensed it down to a few slides, the, what we actually did. Uh, but you know, the reactors go from about one to 10 kilowatts with low mass or HEU and probably 25 to 30 kilowatts for LEU is a good size. And for a first Mars surface system, that might be the better system. Uh, and and uh, it, it's really, it's made to be uh, kind of interchangeable between space and, and surface power. Uh, but uh, the thing I'm kind of going to focus on today is, you know, it, it's people get hung up with specific technologies being able to evolve to high powers. What really matters is if the system can evolve to high powers and especially how it operates, because nuclear testing is something we don't have the ability to do and it's gonna cost billions to do it. And so if you have a system that can operate simply and be tied back to an actual reactor test, that's more important than whether you change like your fuel from uranium nitride to uranium oxide. Uh, so, so let me go to what we did. It was kind of, it was back in 2012 when me and a couple other Los Alamos engineers were just sitting around depressed because we bid on all these programs and nothing had happened and we were wasting our careers. And so we, we said, what's the cheapest thing we can do? The easiest thing to, to show we can make some progress because NASA lost, in 2012, NASA wouldn't touch space reactors at all. And uh, so that, that we wanted to get them back interested and show we could do something. And so we came up with the Duff experiment, um, which convinced this, um, which we successfully did and got NASA interested. There's several NASA people in this picture that, that were there. Uh, and we did this all in six months for a few hundred K of, of funding. Um, and so we'd also done a lot of prior work on heat pipe reactors. And one of the great things about heat pipe reactors is you can test them uh, and, uh, and get the heat out with electrical heaters. And so that, that really helped us um, um, convince uh, NASA that maybe we should go to the next step. So we did all this great stuff in Nut Duff, and I kind of write my slides so people can read them later. I, you know, I don't, I don't go either, through every point because I always run way behind. Uh, but we did get some data. You know, it matched what our model said, uh, and it was, it, it was great. And after about a year and a half, we were convinced NASA to go with Krusty, uh, which 
which is, is, is a flight prototypic reactor. The power system was, was put together as, you know, as cheaply as we could to actually get something done. But what it is, is a, it's a system where you saw this piece of fuel before, uh, where we have fuel stacked up over here. Uh, and there's a, there's a B4C absorber rod which can start up and change the temperature of the reactor. Uh, and then surrounded by beryllium oxide, which is a great neutron reflector, which gives us great safety, uh, uh, both for launch and operational safety, because it's worked with so much that the reactor could never go critical without it, even if it does fall in water. And then these, we have these heat pipes that take heat up. These are sodium heat pipes up the Stirling engines, which creates our electricity. And so we went from this concept to actually uh, developing a system, we actually put it in vacuum to test it. Uh, this shows it a little closer here again are those three fuel pieces. Heat pipes are placed in these slots and then these room rings are uh, um, Haynes 230 alloy that have an interference fit that push the heat pipes in and get us good thermal contact because you need that in space. And then up over here, uh, the reflector which lifts it up around the uh, reactor there's thermocouples everywhere to try to get us data. Uh, so we did this in three years, uh, basically with a you know, hardware milestone every year uh, to get going. But I, I, I know I'm falling behind again, so I'm just gonna uh, go kind of fast. But I do, wanna, I do want to you know, point out, not only was this the first operational data from a new nuclear reactor in the United States in 40 years, or at least a new type of reactor, it, and it was, it was 100% prototypic from the reactor standpoint to what, what we propose to fly. Uh, it also has this other great feature, which is something about the heat pipe reactors we always liked, uh, but never got to the point of showing. It's, it's totally load following and self-regulating. Uh, you don't have to control the reactor at, at all. It, it's all controlled by how much power is drawn from the reactor. Uh, and so the reactor here, all our thermocouples are showing 800C. And what we did was reduce the amount of power draw and increase it back up and show that the reactor can put out that power without you having to touch it. it it's really cool. Um, and, and so it's perfect for deep space operation where we don't have controllers. We also did a lot of more testing. We showed we can get electricity out, which of course is, is, the, <laughs> is the main thing. And if you're really interested, we got a whole special issue of nuclear technology, the ANUS Journal, that talks about this a lot. And, and so there's a lot of near-term deployment options uh, and uh, you know, whether it's at space, moon or Mars, I wanna try to get in a little bit into evolution. And th this is the only chart that is, is impossible to look at, but it's really the technical story of how we evolved to higher power. And the key part of that is we maintain our, uh, our basically our, th our thermal neutronic physics uh, that, that would get us to, um, Oh, sorry, the cat. <laughs> uh, uh, the, um, uh, so we, we, we don't need a nuclear ground test every time we do this. And we change our fuel type, our core structure, and then our technology to get up to the megawatt levels. But I want to at least show some of those. So th this also shows some of the systems of what, you know, what different power levels, uh, different masses, how, how long it would take to develop if you started from scratch. You know, but we don't want to, we don't want to go to the two megawatt reactor now because we think it's a long program and it will have a lot of risk and it probably fail just programmatically. Um, so, but we can evolve there pretty easily. Um, the, the easiest things for us to do are these space reactors that look exactly like Krusty. The 20 kilowatt surface reactor has a little bit of difference and so on. Uh, I'm not going to go through this, uh, but, but it is, if you're a nuclear engineer, a lot, a lot, it gets, it does get harder with power. I mean, there's no arguing against that. Some people think, oh, reactors could put out more power, no problem, but there's always things to deal with. Uh, this is a look at what would be a 650 kilowatt design that we've come up with. Um, and basically it, you have fuel in a stainless steel block and you either have a heat pipe in these white areas or you transition to gas flow. And that's, that's one of the great things about our evolution is we find out when do we wanna to switch to gas flow instead of heat pipes. Well, you can flow it through these holes. You don't need any fancy 
heat transfer geometry and actually low pressure drop is so important in Brayton cycles that this, we find this makes a pretty nice system. Uh, and one of the keys then is uh, this intercooler. Um, we found that we can make the Mars atmosphere work to reduce power uh, to reject our heat, which is, which is huge because deploying a radiator is, wouldn't be as hard as, as solar power, but it, 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 it's so nice that we can package this thing so that we're ready to go. And what we really get limited on is Mach number of, of the atmosphere because it's so thin to get enough flow through. And, and that's, that's what's kind of uh, interesting is, you know, the temperature ranges from, you know, is really low on Olympus Mons, you know, and, 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 and much better in Hellas Planitia, which may be where we want to go for the water, right? Uh, and so we, we, we can do a lot better it when, where there's more atmosphere. And I could go, I'm not going to go into that more just because I'm running so, so low. But we take this reactor in, the, uh, the, our biggest reactor is designed for the Starship uh, fairing. Uh, you know, and then we would have a pre-dug hole and put the reactor down in, and depending on the size, we designed it so that it's about 2.6 meters below the surface, regardless. And that what that does for you is you, you're still allowed to go up and do maintenance on the Brayton system, uh, and, uh, and you're at the point where you're 100 meters away, the reactor dose is 10 times lower than background, and, and, you know, and further as you go from there. So it makes a nice system. Uh, we get to the point where we have, uh, uh, th this is how the scaling goes of the power. Uh, if you look over here at specific power, and again, you know, these, these charts will be on our website and we'll, this video will probably be available for you to back, you know, to pause and rewind if you want to. And so I'm going fast, but you know, specific power really does get better. The watts per gram as, as we go up in power, then you'll see there's kind of a break point where we stop losing. And that's where the point where we just need more and more intercooler recuperator that, that we, we don't benefit anymore. And that's, uh, that, that makes it look like to us, you know, at least for this technology, the, the optimum size is, you know, a few, few megawatts. And oh, by the way, that is, that is where we get to a nine meter uh, diameter intercooler, where we, we basically get to the size of the Starship fairing. And so those two things, you know, make it look like about two and a half. We could get to three and a half megawatts at Hellas Planitia. Uh, we could fit that in there, uh, you know, but, but, you know, you're talking pretty big infrastructure there, you know, that second order outpost. This, that's, this is still way down the line, and I don't want to get people too excited about this because we need to do the simple reactor first, but I thought this this time I'd come in and get, get a little tease of what, what can be done in the future. And then of course you can go, well, oh, and I, I, I did show this once before, but we wanted to do a comparison to solar. I, I haven't seen, you know, we, we, we as space nukes hadn't seen many, uh, uh, what people are proposing for large solar power on Mars. And so we put our own together. Uh, you know, maybe we could sell it. I don't know if space nukes can sell solar power arrays, but but you get you get to th this is a comparison of a 650 kilowatt reactor with a with a with a uh, deployable radiate uh, solar panel that could also fit in Starship. And you see the specific power, you know, specific power of the solar depends on what latitude you're at and what. Uh, uh, what efficiency you assume for these cells, uh, and you know they're not—they're going to have to be pretty robust, right? Uh, so specific volumes, specific energies, and you get—you get such that you really—you um, find the specific power. You know, you're basically limited here with solar, whereas mega power reactors get you know factors of four to five higher, and then you, reactors can continue to grow and even get better. You've got uh, five minutes left, David. Okay, yeah, th that's that's good. I'm kind of making it. Uh, so this would be your first, you know, 20 people on Mars kind of outpost. This is a SpaceX colony concept that I ripped off from them and just added what the six, you know, the 650 or 600 kilowatt solar would look. I and mean, we'd probably want like three 200 kilowatt reactors. 
Then when you got to a pretty big uh, outpost or slash base, say 300 people, you know, maybe we'd have 10 of these 650 kilowatt reactors versus all these solar powers. And then when you get to a really big uh, uh, place on Mars, we say 3000 people, you need about 10 kilowatts a person. Most people come up with that. We did our own study. You know, you can see how much lighter the reactor is in the solar plus the solar. I mean, you, you're gonna have to add a lot of cabling and you got to clean the dust off it and everything so that you would just have like 12 reactors down here versus you know this in terms of solar panels. Uh, I, I'm not going to have time to get into my NTP versus NEP thing but but it really is NTP nuclear thermal propulsion a lot of people are excited about that. It is incredibly hard and I think the programs that are going on with the NASA and DOD now are, are crazy frankly and they know that um, that that they're not pursuing any realistic kind of system. Nothing like we tested before. I think the future is nuclear electric propulsion um, and we can get there. And it's the true game changer if we can get to high enough performance and we can evolve there. And that's really the key. Uh, and so the, the last slide is really, all right, Krusty and Kilopower, great news. Uh, first new space reactor in 50 years. Uh, Human propulsion, a long ways off. Uh, we need to take manageable steps, uh, you know, and uh, uh, unfortunately, NASA and DOE just reverted their old ways, going back to exploring better paper reactors. It, there was, there was going to be a kilopower flight demo, but it, it uh, everything kind of went back to the way as usual. Um, but the good news may be coming. The DOD's Defense uh, Innovation Unit is showing interest in first generation space reactors. This is hugely exciting news. And so hopefully next year, if I'm invited back, I'll have something really new and exciting to talk about because they they look like they might get it, you know, that we need to get going on this stuff and actually do something. All right, that's it. Sorry I took so long, but- uh, No worries, David. Thank you so much for your presentation. I have a question for you. Um, okay. What led you to leave Los Alamos and start Space Nukes? Uh, it was basically because of what happened with DOE and NASA. They, we, they, we were on this path to do a kilopower reactor, a demo, and then NASA decided they were going to go back to the DOE Department of Nuclear Energy, who decided that everything was going to be run by Idaho. You know, it gets into politics, but and then they they stopped. They killed kilopower, and it, you you can. Uh, surmise whatever reason they did that uh, but it's it's the typical uh, it's kind of the typical approach we went to the D doe nnsa to get crusty done we had, had to go around this group of people but nasa decided to go back to them and then we said well we're not going to get anything done as los alamos we need to form this company to try to get this done and maybe find somebody to interested in now maybe dod is going to be the savior. How acceleration tolerant would one of these reactors be? Oh, super. It, yeah, it's, they're, they're, well, I mean, we design them for all the launch loads and landing. Um, and that's, it, the engine, I mean, the engines are going to be the hard part, the Stirling converters, hard part, no matter what with this system, because our reactor is a solid state robust system. The heat pipes provide plenty of strength, um, and we, we engineer it to, to deal with that. So there, there's going to be no problem there. Okay, awesome. Well, we're out of time. Thank you so much, Dr. Poston. This is really exciting work, and congratulations on, on it. All right, thanks a lot. Thanks a lot.